we think about technology from a broad perspective of, of sort of these useful things that we that we make and that we create and that we use, um, that can be everything, like you said, from a shovel to a phone. It has this, this broad spectrum. And there are some significant differences between shovels and phones. But yet the, the common thing in them is that when we use something like a shovel, we could be using it for good or for bad. We could be... Um, you know, digging a hole to, to build a church. We could be digging a hole to um, bury something that we stole or whatever. There could be these morally good and morally bad uses, but either way, at the end of the day, you know, our hands have blisters on them that turn into calluses and our, our muscles change. And the more we do it, our, our abilities change. And so we are sort of transformed in the using of that tool. And we, and we know this sort of intuitively when we walk into a gym. You know, we choose tools based on what part of our body we want to change. Some of them change our arms and some of them change our legs and they change us in different directions. But we don't really think about that when we pick up our phones. You know, we don't always think like, how is this thing going to change me? And how am I going to modify my, my mind and my heart and my soul and my relationships when I pick that up? But it does. Welcome to World Methodist Evangelism's Real Faith, Real World podcast, where we connect the faith within us with the world around us. Celebrating our 50th anniversary, World Methodist Evangelism desires for Christ followers within the global Wesleyan family to become agents of transformation by sharing the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. We accomplish this through training, gathering, and resourcing in our mission to equip and encourage Christ followers around the world to share their faith in the context of today's realities. I'm your host, Rob Haynes. Thank you for listening, and thank you to the generosity of Christ Church Memphis for making this podcast possible. Today's episode is one you are going to want to share far and wide. My guest is John Dyer. John has a unique gift set. He is an important leader in technology, not just for technology's sake, but how it can be used to develop our faith lives. John takes this simple technology and uses it in some amazing ways. Now, this goes beyond watching a sermon online or listening to a song. Now, John has dedicated much of his life to using technology well to introduce people to Jesus and to help them grow closer to him. You are in for a real treat. John, welcome in. Rob, it's great to be with you, man. It's good to see you again. And you too, friend. Uh, Tell us about yourself. Help the listeners get to know you a little bit. Yeah, so I have been um, kind of a a mixture of working in the world of, of, of churches and seminaries and that kind of stuff, doing religious work, but then also doing technology work. So I've been a web developer for probably 20 years, um, getting to, you know, make things for insurance companies, but also get to make some apps that help Christians, you know, some um, Bible websites and tools like that that get used in other countries. And then and then also just some fun little side notes on, on the side. So eventually, uh, Rob and I, we, you and I, we got to meet uh, at Durham when I was really putting these two fields together and, uh, and studying theology and technology at Durham. So I've, I've really had a long interest in, you know, how can I use technology? for the glory of God, but also how do I avoid having technology use me at the same time? Right, right. And you did your PhD at Durham University in the UK, and uh, tell everyone where you are now and what you're doing. Yeah, so I'm in Dallas, Texas, and I work at Dallas Theological Seminary. I serve as a dean of enrollment and distance education, so I kind of oversee the, the trying to make the student process as simple as possible, but also um, a lot of our distance ed stuff. So I get to work with technology there and trying to meet people where they are and bring theological education to them so they can continue ministering to the people that they um, feel called to. And then at the same time, I get to teach a little bit of theology. So we do you know, a class on um, theology, technology, digital culture, and then get to teach things like Trinitarianism and Christology and that, that kind of thing. It's really interesting. John, uh, we've asked you uh, to be on this episode today as part of an occasional series that we're doing related to technology and and faith and uh, spiritual development. Um, you know, here in the pandemic, many churches, many people who are looking to grow their faith have been forced to do that more online as uh, we can't travel so much anymore or we can't gather together in those larger spaces that we've been. Uh, people have been pushed to remote work, remote learning, and we're still, as you and I are recording this in May of 2021, 
unsure of when we'll be able to go back and what's going to happen. Uh, we've all learned how to order on the app and pick up curbside and all that sort of stuff. But uh, why you're here, why I've asked you to be here is because you have been way ahead of this for a long time. And many people are just joining in the conversation, but you've been thinking about this for, for 10 years or more and more and doing some writing. So help us take a long view of our digital lives uh, because we, you know, cell phones aren't new to the pandemic. They've been uh, increasingly a part of our life. And that's what you've been thinking about for quite a while before everyone's been forced to do it. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much there. I mean, so many great, great things you're pointing out. And I think, I think one of the neat things about technology is that it, um, whenever there's a big change, it it always causes us to reflect back on what we were doing before. Maybe some of the things that were unquestioned, as soon as technology either forces us or, or gives us the opportunity to do something different, and we think back and go, what what were we doing? How were we doing, say, Sunday church? And what, why was it important to us to meet for this amount of time on Sundays? And which of these things can go online? And what does that mean? And is it valid? Um, so I, so I think like, you know, one of the, one of the oldest technologies is a mirror that, that reflects back to us ourselves and right. helps us to think about who we are. Um, and so I, I think this opportunity of the pandemic really, uh, you know, allowed us to reflect deeply on, on the technology itself, but also on what it means to be human, what it means to be culture and a community. So when I started, you know, writing about these things, um, th- my big assumption was that, hey, I, I'm going to use technology for good, whatever it is. I, I want to use technology for God's glory. I want to use it for the church. I want to use it for the hurting. You know, that's what I want to do. And um, I had had someone kind of question my assumption and say, um, you know, one of the most dangerous things you can believe is that technology is neutral. Wow. So that that got me kind of really thinking about what I was doing more deeply. And so. When I'm when I'm usually with an audience, I'm trying to get them warmed up. I want to show them a bunch of uh, really cool things you can do with technology. You know, people getting cochlear implants and, and being able to hear for the first time, recalling Jesus saying, "You know, the blind are going to see and the deaf are going to hear." That's how you know I'm 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 the person that John the Baptist was looking for. And then all the bad stuff that we know, the misinformation campaigns, um, just all the stuff that we know is bad with technology. And I'll ask the audience, "Do you think technology is good, bad, or neutral?" And every single time, 95% of the audience will say, it's just neutral. There's good uses and there's bad uses. And so what I'll tell them is my goal for you in this session is is two things. One of them is to tell you that that, uh, the technology is good, full stop, that it is a good gift from God and a deep part of the whole biblical story. And then two is it's never neutral under any circumstances, whether you're using it for good or for bad, it has a shaping power to you and your community and your world around you. And so we want to go kind of deeper into that of, of really thinking more carefully about now what is the role of human making and creativity and what what God is doing in the world, um, not as a as an accident of, of sin or of evil, but really something that God cares about deeply, and then sort of at the same time unpack the ways in which we sort of reshape our lives around the technology once we have it. So when we're in this this pandemic time and we think about what would it mean if we all worked from home, what kind of a society would we have? That's not, you know, sort of a good or bad question. That's a, a, a what kind of life are we going to have and what is the order of it? So I think that that's a good good starting point for us to go deeper. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, John, talk about that some more. If we are created in God's image, what role does technology have in all of that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to give the little like book plug here. Thing is that I, I wrote a book about ten years ago called "From the Garden to the City," and the the idea of that was to sort of trace the arc of the biblical story. That our, our goal is not to stay in a pristine garden, but instead God uh, gave Adam and Eve this command to care and to cultivate it and to to make things from what He had made. So I think of when I when I have my kids and I sort of dump a box of Legos out, I want to just delight in the things that they're going to make. We don't want the Legos to be on the floor forever. We want them to make something with it. So I think God's original command to us was to make things from this world and to explore it and to uh, all the other things that God tells us to do, to have dominion and to multiply and to fill the earth. A lot of that is going to involve acts of making. And so, you know, we don't we don't see a lot of acts of making um, in the garden, but we do see Adam creating language, which shapes what we see and don't see about the world. And so as we, as we take this through, we see all these times where, where God seems to really care, not just about our, our souls and our bodies, but also the things that we make, where he makes technology part of the story with Noah and moves on and on throughout the story of things like the very first time the Spirit of God descends on a person. It's not um, Abraham or Sarah, and it's not Moses or Miriam. It's Bezalel, this guy who was called to make and to create things, to take a the messages that that God had given um, to Moses and and make them in a, in a way that a largely illiterate culture could see and smell and breathe and touch and taste um, while they were worshiping God. 
And so I think even in the in the Ten Commandments, we see that the Second Commandment is about how we use imagery to portray God and that that matters to Him. And so as we as we walk through story by story, we see, man, God God cares about what we make and and um, how that images Him as a Creator at the same time. So again, technology is not this this accident. In fact, the the, the story ends with us going forward to a city full of roads and trumpets and banners and all the things that humans make. And however we take that, whatever charts or timelines we have to get to that end period of time, it certainly certainly portrays something physical, a reality where the things that we make matter to God. So I think that that gives us, man, such such energy and joy to think about the things that we're making now. How can I make and use things today in, in light of that day when God wipes away every tear? And that helps us to think about what technologies would be in that time and which ones wouldn't be, um, and help us to think about how we could order our lives in a way that is um, ethical now, but also forward-looking. About a year or so ago, you and I had a conversation about technology um, impacting us, whether that be an iPhone or a shovel that we would dig a hole with in the Mm -hmm. backyard. And uh, you reminded me that all technologies impact us in some way. Could you uh, just unpack that a little bit more? Do you remember that conversation? Yeah, yeah. And I think, so one of the things you're kind of getting at is is how we use the word technology. So let me start with that kind of a, a definition of, um, so that we can get to this idea of changing. Yeah, so one of the funniest definitions of, of technology is just that it's anything invented after we were born. And, and the, the reason for that is that most of us, everything that is is there when we're born just kind of is stuff. It's just the way the world works. And we don't really question it. And Doug Adams, the guy that wrote the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, would say everything before you were born, like I said, is just stuff. Everything from about zero to 35 is this cool, amazing stuff you can build your career on. But around the time you turn 30, 35, everything after that starts to feel like the destruction of society and the degradation of our children's minds, right? Because it feels foreign to us, as foreign as, say, wearing masks, right? This technology that's so powerful and does something so incredible for us, it does make us feel different when we we use it. Um, so if we if we think about technology from a broad perspective of, of sort of these useful things that we that we make and that we create and that we use, um, that can be everything like you said from a shovel to a phone. It has this this broad spectrum, and there are some significant differences between shovels and phones. But yet the the common thing in them is that when we use something like a shovel, we could be using it for good or for bad. We could be um, you know, digging a hole to, to build a church. We could be digging a hole to um, bury something that we stole or whatever. There could be these morally good and morally bad uses, but either way, at the end of the day, you know, our hands have blisters on them that turn into calluses and our, our muscles change. And the more we do it, our, our abilities change. And so we are sort of transformed in the using of that tool. And we, and we know this sort of intuitively when we walk into a gym. You know, we choose tools based on what part of our body we want to change. Some of them change our arms and some of them change our legs and they change us in different directions. But we don't really think about that when we pick up our phones. You know, we don't always think like, how is this thing going to change me? And how am I going to modify my, my mind and my heart and my soul and my relationships when I pick that up? But it does. You know, the way that we read on screen, for example, is very different than the way we read in a book. Um, and those those patterns uh, develop us in different ways, just sort of like long distance running develops our legs in a different way than leg presses develop us. Um, the devices we use to read um, change our mind and, and kind of its abilities and, and the direction that it's uh, most attuned to. So I think we want to be you know aware of that uh, just at the, the pure capacity level by thinking about you know, what kind of uh, physical and mental person do I want to become? But then also at the sort of deeper levels of our relationships and our souls, what kinds of uh, what kinds of communities do we want to cultivate? And in some ways that will be determined by what types of technology we, we emphasize. And then even even sometimes when we choose to use it in a little bit different way than we might have, uh, we might have if we just used it kind of according to the way it was designed or the way that everybody else is using it. It's really interesting. A minute ago, you talked about the ages and um, the way we look at technology Mm -hmm. as we grow older. Mm -hmm. Churches in particular have struggled with technology, and frequently that is around some of these different age categories that you're talking about. Um, For many, particularly the smaller churches, have drawn hard lines to say that Mm -hmm. church was open only when you were meeting in person. There's a Mm -hmm. a church not too far from me that has that on the that's had that on the sign Mm -hmm. uh, all through the pandemic. Church is open, Uh, but others um, and and some that that uh, you and I are colleagues with have really advanced um, digital spaces. 
uh, in terms of worship and what that means. But now that we're seeing a, a light at the end of the tunnel in some parts of the world for COVID, how are churches and their digital presence responding? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question and such an insightful part of just looking at this world and reflecting, like we said early, earlier, about you know what it is that we were doing before the pandemic. And as, as you mentioned, you know, there have been experiments with online church and internet-related church stuff back into the 80s. Um, and there, there were different kinds of um, online services that were around, but but you know it wasn't until 2020 that really everybody had experienced this. This was a sort of a theoretical thing before that. But but I don't think that that's entirely true. I mean that that's true for Sunday morning services. But if if you think about it this way, um, you know when we look in the in the Bible, there's sort of this uh, couple of uses of that term ecclesia or church. And sometimes the word church is used for like a local congregation, the church in Philippi or the churches in Galatia. And sometimes it's used for kind of the, what we would call the universal church, you know, to refer to everyone gathered under Christ, um, that Paul was persecuting the church, meaning, meaning all believers before he became a believer himself. And so we, we have this interesting scenario in which there's, there's little bodies of people. And then there's sort of this larger body that Christ wants to be one. And we're not always doing the, the best job of that. But um, but then in between sessions, in between times where Paul would visit somebody or one of the other other apostles would visit, they would use this technology of writing. And so you know the in the in the epistles of the second and third John and some of the other places, Peter and Paul also refers to their letters quite often about why they're using it and and um, what their purpose in doing that was. And so we see in, in some sense that this technology of, of writing in their day was able to sort of connect local bodies together and to strengthen the universal church, to strengthen the, the whole body of Christ. And so we might have gatherings on a Sunday, um, you know, we might meet for 90 minutes, um, but throughout the week, we're always connecting through different sort of networks of other believers using technology. So we might, in a given week, you know, connect to a, a parent or a child or a friend in a different city who are, who are under Christ. We might connect to um, other other churches, their resources or um, or sermons or books. Um, so we're always using technology to connect the broader church together. It may just be that that we uh, in the past it was only local local physical churches where we actually did maybe things like worship and song. But even then, we might go out to a, a retreat center and do the same thing together in person. So I think the idea that uh, that the church has has always been in person isn't really true. I think that the um, the church has always historically going back to the sort of origin of the Bible itself been interconnected by technology. And so technology is sort of this bridge between the local church and the universal church, between um, the, the individual bodies of Christ and the larger body of Christ together. It's one of those, those tools that the body of Christ uses. So the difference of, of not being able to gather physically for worship, that is still pretty significant. I mean, I think that we are called to be together. We're called to gather in some way. But at the same time, one, one of the issues in the way this is sometimes talked about is that people will use terms like real instead of virtual, or they'll talk about being disembodied. And I think it's really worth pointing out, Rob, you and I are, are not anywhere near one another, right? Um, and we're both very much embodied right now. And so is the listener of this podcast, even though they'll be listening way, way after we record this. And you told me before we started that you are standing while you're recording and I'm sitting while we're recording. Those are both profoundly important parts of our embodiment and the way that we are being in the world. So we are not disembodied, but we are embodied with a particular posture. And you and I had to turn off our cameras earlier, so now we can't see one another. That that uh, that that lack of of, uh, of visual, but still having audio, that's significant to us because these are different aspects of of what it means to be human. And so I think it would do us some some good to be more attentive to those things about what kind of embodiment we're having and and the meaning of that embodiment, because it is very different to be um, you know sitting next to a family member watching a TV and sort of. Uh, consuming a, a worship service than it is to be on one's own, say, phone and, and interacting with somebody in a small group Bible study on Zoom or something like that. Those those forms um, matter deeply. That that uh, you know a Facebook live stream is quite different than a Zoom stream, and different yet again from say a virtual reality headset, which which allows a whole different form of of interaction and connection. Where um, on Zoom, you know, the, we've all seen those that grid of of people where you're 
looking at everybody and everybody's looking at one another. And when it ends, there's no way to kind of have little private conversations. In, in VR, there are great ways to go off and have private conversations because of the spatial nature of that technology. And yet, you can't use it with somebody. It's a very privatized experience at the same time. So again, I, I don't think it's particularly useful to talk about things like disembodiment or to talk about things of, of virtual versus real. Instead, what I think we should do is, like the Israelites, we want to we pay attention to all of these things that are happening in worship, to the posture of our bodies, to the posture of our voices, to the sights and smells and, and all of those things, and why those matter to us as being embodied humans. Um, and, and how that affects us relationally to uh, those people who are around us or online, and also in our relationship and connection with God. Really interesting to think about technology as something other than a laptop or a phone or uh, mm -hmm. you know Zoom or whatever it may be. You're talking about technology in terms of the written word, which at one time was the most profound technology of the time, or you know, uh, all roads leading to Rome is a whole nother technology that uh, we find is, is one of the things that leads to the dissemination of the Gospels and uh, the writing of the New Testament. And so throughout these different aspects of our history, uh, we've seen that, the God, that God has used the church um, and used these technologies in harmony with one another for the propagation of the Gospel. Yeah, Rob, I mean, you're pointing out some great things, again, that, that our definition of technology sometimes is just when we use it with our friends, we might be saying, um, you know, recent internet connected devices. But really, there's, there's a broad spectrum of technology throughout human history, all of which I, I think are often used for God's glory, but also sort of change society at the same time. And so, like, like you mentioned, you know, with the advent of even just the technology of the alphabet, moving from sort of pictograms to alphabet, that's happening somewhere kind of in the, in the region of where Israel was, somewhere around, you know, the 1800s BC. So, you know, when, when we think Moses is writing things down, that's a really relatively new technology to be writing that down. Um, even when, uh, when the, the documents in the New Testament are being assembled, at that time, you know, a, a scroll is sort of what you use for something um, significant, some religious documents. Um, they had invented this idea of taking pages and stitching them together into what we would now call a codex, um, but people didn't use that for important stuff. So when Christians began using that, um, for whatever reason, we're not quite sure why they did, that became kind of a signifier that they began being called the people of the book or the people of the codex because they liked that te te technology, whether it was because it was easy to travel with or you could put sort of more things together um, in, in one document, say the, the four canonical gospels, you could put those together all in one um, codex, which you couldn't do with a scroll. Um, all, all those things have had, you know, sort of effects on the way that we've done done church. And so we think, think about today, oftentimes we're, we're really enamored with whatever is, is new so um, there, there's kind of the old, old famous statement that uh, sometimes technology is indistinguishable from magic if it's new. But once it's been around for a little while, we usually don't question it very much. And so I think we, we want to be, you know, looking at and, and really interrogating new technology as it comes along and, think, and using it and kind of uh, trying to say, now, now what happened and having that dialogue and community with one another. But we also want to go back and, and question some of the older stuff, too, of, of, you know, the kinds of lives we live and the cars that we drive around and the houses that we have. Um, and so our, I, I even think about, you know, as I look through the scriptures, um, there's, there's a couple of fun little places where uh, the acts of making that we that we do are sort of questioned and, and pushed on a little bit. So, you know, I was, I'm doing a little Bible reading plan this year, and I came across a little passage in, in Deuteronomy recently. And um, it's just a little law and a kind of a list of random laws. And it just says when you're, when you're building a house with kind of a really high roof, that you should build a parapet around it um, so that no one falls and dies. So I think there's this uh, sort of built into that, this sort of responsibility that when we're making things, we, we do want to be thinking about how they might get used and what kind of uh, harm they might have for other people. And one of the most uh, other kind of often repeated commands in Scripture, you see it all throughout the, um, the, the Pentateuch and the law. We see it through the Proverbs and all through the prophets is some type of this idea of that God hates unjust scales, but that he loves accurate weights, right? 
And, and I think the reason why this is just, I mean, it's probably in 20 verses um, th- throughout all the different uh, genres of Old Testament literature is that is that God is recognizing that sometimes the things that we make, um, they they can be used at an individual level. You know, you and I can, I can send you mean things on my phone to you, but the technology has this sort of systemic way of affecting everybody. And it's possible to develop mass scale technology that can really um, either promote justice or promote injustice. You know, when we talk about sort of systemic evil or systemic injustice, I think this is built into passages like that of saying, you know, the way that we, uh, the technologies that we build and that we um, that we buy into really can affect sort of the, the least of these and the marginalized. So we can use technology to, to reach people that we couldn't ever reach, say, um, take church into a hospital with someone that couldn't participate live, but we can also cut out people that might not have access to those same technologies. So I think as, as believers, we want to be um, aware of that and be thinking, how can I not only promote the gospel, but also promote the justice that's built into the gospel in the way that we we use our technology. That's really interesting, John. And you touch on a lot of things that I have really appreciated about your work. Um, so when the pandemic hit, churches rushed to replicate their Sunday service by, you know, streaming the uh, the worship service with a camera in the back and putting it out on Facebook Live or something like that, mm-hmm. or moving Bible studies onto Zoom so that they could replicate mm-hmm. as closely as possible that uh, those activities that they did uh, just before the pandemic started. But, you know, back to what you were just saying, one of the really interesting things about your work is that you're using technology in ways other than just watching a sermon or streaming a song or or doing something on Zoom. So with that in mind of what you're talking about, of all of these different creative ways, would you just share some of your projects and creations that you've done? Because you've done some really fascinating stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and these are um, these are probably you know pre-pandemic things, not really totally related to that, but just other fun things. So when I you know when I was in seminary um, studying Greek and Hebrew, one of the things that I uh, wanted to be able to do was just to look up um, passages a little bit more quickly and to be able to sort of compare versions and you know look up those Greek and Hebrew words without a lot of trouble and see the linkages between um, the English and the Greek. And so I did make one little thing called. BibleWebApp.com that is just sort of a, a lightweight Bible software application that lets you uh, open up multiple versions and do different kinds of comparisons. And, you know, I just sort of made that for myself, but then there was a company um, or, or a ministry called the Digital Bible Society that thought, you know, we could probably pack that into, you know, little SD chips or CDs or onto phones and sideload them onto Android devices and, and just take them and kind of flood markets that don't have even legal printed Bibles. So if you could imagine a country where, where it's illegal to have a printed Bible, it's a lot easier to access digital ones because there's something that you can hide something that you can do do covertly. So it's been really, really uh, encouraging just to be involved in that and just have, you know, hundreds of thousands of these things go out into different areas, um, but also be able to provide for people in the church. Um, and then, you know, one, one of the other ones that I also did what kind of while I was in seminary was, you know, one of the, one of the common questions that comes up is, um, you know, what's the best commentary on Mark? I'm going to preach through that. Or what's the best commentary on Isaiah or something like that? And so, you know, different different professors at different schools have these, these sort of lists of their favorite ones. And there's been a couple of, of books, kind of big, giant bibliographies of, you know, annotated references to different commentaries. And I thought, you know what? What if I could make a Rotten Tomatoes for uh, kind of a, a rating of biblical commentary? So I made this little website called bestcommentaries.com. And that sort of is exactly that. It's, it's uh, just kind of aggregates reviews and ratings from, you know, websites and books and journals and tries to pull them together so that if you're looking for kind of all the stuff that's on, you know, the Gospel of John or, or something like that or, or, the, or Deuteronomy, you can look for those things and get a bunch of different reviews and ratings. Um, so that's been a really interesting one. I want to come back to that one in terms of um, sort of the role of, of algorithms at some point. But, um, you know, other other fun little things, uh, you know, there's a, a Bible reading plan generator.com. So if you've ever wanted to try to read all the Bible or part of a Bible in a certain way, you can just kind of check off the books that you want and um, say, you know, you want to read Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, a chapter or something like that. Um, it'll, it'll build you a little plan and you can break it up in sort of whatever way you want and visualize it whatever way you want. So I just enjoy, you know, thinking of if there's a tool that I thought, man, I could use this, then I then maybe somebody else could. And so I enjoy enjoy making that. And I'll, I'll mention one other just fun one was um, I was trying to kind of learn a little bit more about artificial intelligence and how it works. And 
um, how it understands texts and, and those things. And so I made a little website called worship.ai. So worship.ai is artificial intelligence. And if you go there, what it does is it'll, it'll load in either um, a bunch of contemporary Christian music, or you can have it load in the Psalms and kind of learn from those and then try to try to generate um, a, uh, a something that sounds similar to it. And so it, it just sort of gives you a sense of um, what, what technology is possible and also, um, you know, that, that a lot of what we have with AI is sort of what we put into it is what we're going to get back out of it. And so it teaches us a lot about our own the biases that are built into our own language, um, the biases that are built into the way that we structure, the way that we talk. And so when we feed AI um, a book, it's it's going to get all the biases that we have in there. Or if we feed it a set of images, it's going to have that as well. So I think we're learning a lot about you know ourselves as we develop those things. But those are just a couple of little fun things I've made over the last couple of years. That's fun. And one of my favorite that you've made over the last few years is to help us understand uh, first person, second person, and third person. Yeah. Uh, when you do that with you know singular plurals and and plurals to large groups of people. So in the southern part of the United States, I may ask you if you want some sweet tea. If I'm talking to one person, if I'm going to talk to uh, two people, I'm going to ask if y'all want some sweet tea. And if I'm going to talk to everybody, I want to know if all y'all want some sweet tea. <laughs> That's right. And uh, and you helped the world understand that a little bit better in reference to Greek. So please pitch that one too. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, on top of the BibleWebApp.com that we talked about a minute ago, I just built a little website called Y'all Version. So it's a play on you version. It's Y'all Version. And it, you know, looks for all those second person plurals anytime where the underlying Greek or Hebrew, um, they have a, a different word for you and y'all like we do here in the South. Um, and so I just kind of pulled those out so you can see all the little places where it would say y'all or y'all selves. And, you know, there, there's some real significant places where you see that, you know, the, one of the first ones that comes to mind is, you know, in Genesis where the serpent is talking to Eve, um, the serpent doesn't say, did, did God really say to you? It says, did God really say to y'all? And so what it sort of indicates is that, you know, Adam is there in this story, even though he's addressing Eve, that it, it means that um, Adam is probably there, which you don't see for several more verses or, or even some of our favorite um you know, kind of bumper sticker verses uh, like Jeremiah 29, 11, that says, you know, for I know the plans I have for y'all, plans to prosper y'all. And and I think that that kind of gives you a different sense that, that God could, you know, in a sense, mean individuals collectively, like everybody gets their own tea. In your example, all y'all get a tea. But I think to, to be to be reminding reminding ourselves that God is addressing a group of people there and not this isn't sort of just about me and my my individual life and my individual flourishment um, or, or sort of therapeutic deism, if we put it that way. Um, so if we go throughout, you know, a lot of the places in the New, Te- New Testament where you know, the, the authors there, they're, they're usually addressing a group or a body of believers. And so it just changes the tenor a little bit. So yeah, y'all version can be a fun way of, um, of just looking at the scripture a new way. And, and, you know, one of these days I'd love to make that into a printed version so that you can actually sit down and, and read it <laughs> <laughs> and have it be yeah. one of those projects that went jumps from digital back to print. Yeah. And it is fun, but you're right. It does teach you much. Uh, uh, it, it gives you a deeper understanding of the scripture to understand just what you're saying that, that to whom is, is the writer speaking? To whom is God speaking in this? And and the spiritual implications of that. And also, it's important to mention that for those who do not speak Southern U.S. language, uh, you even translate that as well, too. Yeah, that's right. So you can change it. Um, you can make it where it just changes the color of it, or you can make it be y'all, or you can change it to yins for those who are up in Pittsburgh, or you skies for Chicago, or you lot for kind of UK, uh, Australia type groups. So yeah, you can change it to a couple different ones if, if y'all just, just doesn't quite feel right in the Bible. I love it. Well, I know that whoever's listening now, uh, and and all y'all who are listening right now would, uh, would know that... Uh, there are lots of resources that John has tapped into, not only just uh, for helping us think about technology and in terms of our own spiritual development, but also some very practical tools from a Bible reading plan to other ways that we can engage in worship. John, if someone wanted to follow your work or uh, learn more about what you're doing, what's the best way uh, to follow you? Yeah, so I have a little website that um, is just j.hn so it's just my name but instead of it's instead of an o it's just a period so j.hn and that has some basic information about me i'd love to get in contact with anybody who'd, who'd like to um, and there's a couple links to some of these projects there 
That's great. John, we like to ask our listeners about what they found. Maybe something they're reading, or maybe it's a website they encountered, an app, or something like that that has uh, uh, encouraged them or just been thought provoking or particularly interesting. So, John Dyer, what have you found? You know, one thing that comes to mind is I recently ran a class here at ETS uh, on theology and, and, and digital culture. And there's a student in there, his name's Andy Gears, and he made the app Prayer Mate, which is one of the kind of more popular um, prayer applications. And he just had a lot of thoughtful things to say about how he, uh, what he considered in that app. And for example, he considered whether or not to add the concept of a streak in there. And he thought, you know, maybe, maybe it wouldn't be so good to, to put that in there because we don't want to be, um, having people pray just because they want to get a streak, you know. So he's been really, really thoughtful about that. And he's actually working on a, on a video game. I think it's called Serpent and Seed where he wants to sort of retell some of the biblical stories through the idea of games. And he had some really great thoughts about sort of the gamification of the spiritual life. And so I would just say, check out, you know, Prayer Mate and all the things that Andy's working on, because, you know, he's one of those guys that is um, really talented in what he makes, but also very thoughtful in the way he makes it and trying to make it in a way that, that honors God and honors the abilities that he's given him. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I always love uh, those type of opportunities to learn more about those things. My, what I found um, is from someone that you and I connected with when we were together uh, doing our doctoral studies, and that is David Wilkinson's book, When I Pray, What Does God Do? Uh, David is uh, there at Durham University in the UK, uh, also a uh, astrophysicist and a theologian both. So talking about connecting science and technology and faith, David does that so very well. And his book um, really helps us to think about the world in, in uh, much, um, much more nuanced ways when we're praying and what's going on and just how God is involved. So I think it's a good challenging read, and I think it ties right into what we're saying today. When I pray, what does God do? John, thank you so much for the conversation. I hope we can have you back and continue this. So rich. Man, this is great, Rob. It's so good to connect with you again. I appreciate your ministry and your work. You know, it sounds silly, but it's worth asking, did the serpent really say, did God say to you or did God say to y'all? Or does God really have a plan for you? Or did God say God has a plan for y'all? Could technology be used in something as simple as things like this to help us understand a deeper meaning of the word that we have our limitations from our own languages? I really appreciate the way John has used his gifts and talents and his heart that God has given him to help us understand how we can grow to be more like Jesus through the things that we find ourselves involved in day after day, whether it be using a shovel or a phone or anything in between. You'll also find the links to the things I found in today's show notes. We would love to hear from you. Write to us at podcast at worldmethodist.org. We love to hear your feedback, your thoughts, or suggestions for future episodes. Would you take a minute to also be sure to rate and subscribe? It really helps us get the word out. Look at today's show notes for our social media connections and all the ways that you can also connect with us. We appreciate hearing from you and connecting. We also appreciate Christ Church Memphis for sponsoring this episode. I'm Rob Haynes. You've been listening to WME's Real Faith, Real World Podcast.